Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and people. Welcome to episode eight of MW in a Nutshell, which is episode four of Flashbang in a Nutshell for the show dated the 12th of September 2021 Pacific Daylight Time. And this wasn't just a ordinary show, this was a super show hosted as always on twitch.tv forward slash Edward Bosco. Your host for MW Flashbang in a nutshell, MW's resident bookkeeper and statistician, Carla Bader from Victoria, Australia. Without further ado, let's get into our sequence of events for the Flashbang Super Show. So first of all, we started off with an audio promo from our Lionel Matrix. And in this promo, Lionel is amused that the Merc Alexis Edmonton thinks Lionel himself controls Lady Nausea. What a foolish statement to make. But even Lady Nausea was amused by that statement. Once again, it seems that Alexis Edmonton seems to twist Lionel Matrix's words into whatever narrative suits Alexis best. Lionel says that he follows Lady Nausea's bidding, not the other way around, and that Her Grace has asked him to put an end to the charade. Lionel says that he will be happy to fight Alexis and her new toy, her armour, at the Super Show. Also, just for the record, Lady Nausea has no interest in this upcoming match whatsoever, so there are no excuses if Alexis Edmonton suffers a loss. So now we go to that actual match, a singles match. We have Lionel Matrix on the left there with Henry Colt at ringside and then Alexis Edmonton in the Samus-like armor. And yeah, it seemed to turn out the way um, we thought in Lionel's promo. Lionel Matrix won that match against Alexis Edmonton with a pin. So I guess we'll see what happens with that. I mean, hopefully Alexis can bounce back in some way or it just goes to show, you know, don't mess with Lionel and Lady Nausea. Okay, so next up we have our second audio promo of the evening by Mad World's Madness, who was a part of the cartel for a while, but split off. So in this promo, Madness says, now it has come to this. The Super Show, that so much hard work was put in to get to where the Mad World are to face the cartel for the tag belts. Mad World have made history and that Kuso Kale of the Mad World is the first woman in m &W to win gold, title gold. And then also Mad World contains the first man to pin not one, but both of the Bone Warriors, which is a, another team on Flashbang. And then also Mad World are the first non-predictable title belt holders. It doesn't matter if Mad World wins or loses because the message has been sent. And if you play your cards right, then you can get anybody to do whatever you want. But Mad World still plans to find, uh, fight, excuse me. Mad World still plans to fight tooth and nails to keep the belt. And Victor Vicious better watch out or Mad World would be the one saying Arrivederci. So next up we have that second match there, the tag team title defense match. We have Nitsi Gunkobla and Victor Vicious of the cartel facing off against the current belt holders, the Mad World containing female Kuso Kale, who is the wife of Hutch Kale, as well as our Madness. So you'd think it would be Hutch and Nitzig in the tag scene, but Hutch has a match later on with interdimensional star Brawl Kaiser, and so Victor Vicious decided he wanted in on the action. In this situation, Mad World is going to retain their belts as Madness pins Victor Vicious. So next up, we have another match. It is a singles match. As we remember, Suicide Gemini seems to have been, I don't know, causing a few 
issues, confusions here and there. He was seen at Apex's Bayou compound last time. Uh, yeah, this just keeps getting messier and messier by the minute. And so Blight Howless in his newly rejuvenated form, if we remember Artemis gave Blight the cure against the wishes of Jagger Blackthorn. So Suicide Gemini is up against Blight Howless. And in this match, Blight Howless seems to continue his win streak with a pinfall. And then next up, we have our third audio promo. There are two of them. First up, we have Triple A's El Pollo de la Muerte, and then a response by the Cyberbots Cyber Controller. So in El Pollo de la Muerte's section, um, El Pollo says, It's been a strange few weeks on flashbang for El Pollo himself. He came out of Multivania on the bottom and then wanted to fight the most passionate, hungry competitors as he climbed to the top. He never expected the heart of a fighter to beat within a metal chest in which he mentions Cool J. Kyo. He admits that the battle bot Cool J. Kyo has reignited El Pollo's fighting spirit. However, El Pollo is disappointed that Kyo decided to ally with the cyber controller. El Pollo can't help, at, can't help but laugh at the cyber controller and that apparently the only thing that cyber controller could come up with when they lost their last tag match was that triple A won because they have tagged longer. Did it perhaps occur to the cyber controller that the better team simply won that day? And then the cyber controller himself responds to that statement he says to El Pollo that hearts can easily be broken, that there are emotions that exist such as suffering, rage and despair, and that they are nothing but weaknesses. Cyber Controller boasts that he is devoid from such weakness, and then he says that he wasn't making an excuse about the Cyberbot's loss, but rather a logical explanation. But then with more data... Cyber Controller assures that the same outcome won't happen again. The Cyberbots accept El Pollo's new challenge, but they have been upgraded. And once again, Triple A have been told, probably along with the rest of the organic roster, to fear the deletion. Uh, if you... Uh, yeah, we won't go there. Next! So we have that match next up, which is our fourth match of the afternoon since the Super Show was in the afternoon that day. We have Cyber Controller and Cool J Kyo of the Cyberbots. Cool J Kyo with his one and only showcase win against Otoro Azul and El Pollo de la Muerte. So our powerhouse and our, not sure, submission specialist? Yeah, I'll have to check that one. But Otoro and El Pollo of Animals Against Apex, accompanied by Sheepy and Demolition Fox. In this case, it looks like the Cyberbots promo response has come to light as Cyber Controller had a pin victory against El Pollo de la Muerte. And then we have another match here, our fifth match, a singles match, which is our Omni Slayer face-off. As mentioned before, Jagger Blackthorn is none too happy with Artemis, perhaps because of maybe pressure from the other Omni Slayers, you know, peer pressure. Artemis gave the cure to Blight Howless against the wishes of the other Omni Slayers, and then there was a in ring standoff last week, you know, about like, I do what's right, and is it, you know, should you act with your gut or should you act in the interest of your organization? And so, therefore, a Omni Slayer face off has occurred, and it seems that the student has surpassed the teacher. Artemis won that match with a pinfall to Jagger Blackthorn. Next up, we have an audio promo from Vaporwave's Apollo Hades who has been, in my eyes, exhibiting a bit of strange behaviour lately. I don't condone people turning on others' backs, betraying. I'm not sure where this is going. But without further ado, here is the latest promo from Apollo Hades. 
I need to flip to page two of my notes. So it says that Apollo is delighted with himself and he does not fear the amalgamation of people parts and duct tape that Dr. Caliban calls a son. So this, um, if you recall the creation, he's got like duct tape all over him and he's like a Frankenstein as it were. That's basically what Apollo's calling him. And then Apollo goes on to say, perhaps spend more time fixing Sandman's back than making idle threats. Apollo Hades fears nothing, not Dr. Caliban, not the Time Bandits, not Christopher the Creation. So then how about a match any time at, with any stipulation? It won't matter because Dr. Caliban's son will just be another moth drawn to the flame of Vaporwave's constant success. And then he goes on to say his, at the moment, tedious catchphrase, I'm hotter than you. Oh, uh, is there, I don't know, any flaming characters? Guess we'll find out there. So then we have that match, our sixth match of the afternoon, a singles match against the Creation and Apollo Hades. The Creation being accompanied by all members of the House of Caliban, Dr. Caliban himself, as well as Sandman and other adopted son, Thunderbolt. And then Apollo Hades being accompanied by his Vaporwave faction member, Aqualung. And in this case, the creation wins against Apollo Hades. Apollo had tapped out to the Wheel of Pain. And now we have a fifth audio promo from Honor Bounds, Deluna 13, as well as Bulldog Grant Martin. So in this promo, Deluna says Kevin Blackwell loves stats, hey? But turnabout is fair play. So let's have a look at Kevin Blackwell's statistics. It apparently is one win to seven losses on pay-per-views, including two from Deluna and one against Shere Khan. And then Grant Martin goes on to say, don't forget my contributions to the stats. And then he goes on to state that Shere Khan is a fierce tiger that knows more about beating the odds than Kevin Blackwell ever will. And despite the idea of Simon joining the team, friends will always stand by each other. Honor Bound will gladly be in Shere Khan's corner if he wants or needs it. And then Deluna says that Kevin Blackwell's first mistake was targeting the luchadors in the first place, being Deluna and then Shere Khan. And then there was also, I think, Deluna 13's father, El Chavo, so all them and more. And so that was Kevin Blackwell's first mistake, but apparently it won't be his last either. And then Grant Martin says, as for Jack the Questionable, pick whatever insult he wants to wear to the ring, you know, whatever silly clown garment he wants to put on. It doesn't matter to the bulldog anymore. Just bring his ass over because the bulldog is coming to bury him. Roof! Uh, sorry, I can't do it as well. I will just leave that to Grant Martin. That is your unique chant. So we have that match, our seventh match, a singles match with Grant Martin, accompanied by fellow faction member Deluna13 against the insult-wearing mercenary Jack the Questionable. I mean, we don't seem to see much on him. He seems to be pretty ordinary in terms of costume, but then here's me thinking it wouldn't be much of a super show if he didn't come out with anything. I'm thinking compared to all the ridiculous stuff he's worn in the previous weeks. And then we notice he's got these golden boots on. I mean, where the heck did they come from? And, you know, we thought this was going to be a fair fight. Everything seemed to be going well. But then at the end, you know, Jack the Questionable's got these brass knuckles. Where the heck did they come from? And unfortunately, we don't know where on earth the Firing Line production has gone, so I don't have footage evidence of those brass knuckles being used, but believe me, at your own peril, that is how Jack the Questionable got a cheat win. But next up, we have an audio promo from the cartel's Mandalorian, Hutch Kale. It is a restatement from what he had stated the previous week. 
He's saying that no matter what Mad World may have done, you must never touch the wife of Hutch Kale, Kuso Kale. If, you know, if there is a problem, if anybody has a problem, you must always go after madness. Kuso Kale is off limits and if you touch Kuso, there is going to be hell to pay. So we then have a singles match, which is our interdimensional title defense. We have the Mandalorian of the cartel, Hutch Kale, against our good boy, Sentai hero, Brawl Kaiser. And this time we have a belt retainership. Um, how do I call it? Yes, Brawl Kaiser wins that match with a pinfall against Hutch Kale, and therefore the title is kept with Brawl Kaiser. But then what concerned me is apparently after the match, Brawl makes a social media tweet. I myself as a good girl don't condone swearing. He's a good boy, so where the blip and blip did that come from? I, I swore, but I censored myself. All right, that's a bit much. Next. We then have our seventh audio promo of the afternoon from all members of Spectre Sonata being the Bad CG Ghost, Punk Master Ghost and TK, with our respondent being Big Rock of the Forces of Nature. So in this promo, apparently Big Rock is hiding in the Spectre Sonata quarters. He is disguised as a lamp and then he is eavesdropping on the conversation of the other faction members. Spectre Sonata are tired out from all the training they did, being CG Ghost and PM Ghost in this case. CG asked TK if she had cooked enough Gaulish goulash for the three of them as well as their new lamp buddy. PM goes on to say, hey, you know, how long has Big Rock been around for? A week? TK heard noise from the other room and then there was a hole in the wall. And then there was Big Rock in the corner wearing a lampshade. As Spectre Sonata mentioned their upcoming match with the forces of nature, the Big Rock, uh, Big Rock lamp apparently speaks. And then, oops, he crashes and he ruins everything, you know, realising he shouldn't be there. Oh, it's a bit rude, I'll go the other way as Big Rock then completely ruins the property. I don't know how much is left, if... You know, Spectre Sonata need to pay any repair bills. Um, I did, uh, I'm more of a statistician than a current accountant. If you need bill costs, please go to Forest T. Wade for that until further notice. Next up, we have our ninth match of the afternoon, which is a tag team match. So in this match, it is the number one contendership match for the tag belts. So in this case, whoever wins the match will go on to face Mad World in subsequent weeks for a chance at the belts. So we have Big Rock and Tree Boy, huge main of the forces of nature, and then the bad CG ghost and punk master ghost of Spectre Sonata, accompanied by their fellow faction member TK. In this case, Big Rock wins the match against PM Ghost with Rock and a hard place. So because of Big Rock's win, the forces of nature will be able to face Mad World for a opportunity at the tag belts. We then have an audio promo from Warzone's workrate Wilson, son of Will. And in this promo, Wilson says it has finally come to this, facing Doom for the trio's titles. This match will go down in history. Not just because of the greatest match, but it is also what kickstarts Wilson's work rate, Wilson's ascent into legend and doom into obscurity. The bile bolsh that Zerikus spewed out a few weeks ago is about to come and bite him in the backside. And then, how can we not remember that Wilson, son of Will, beat Fear Strikes all on his own in that week if we? Remember in the um, Nexus Titan Championship match, it was Wilson, son of Will versus Fear Strikes back then. And then Wilson goes on to say, you know, does Zerikus say unfocused? Work rate Wilson says visionary. The stars will align and shine on VIP. I'm sorry, Wilson, but if you watched Warzone this week, uh, 
Yeah, you can check that out in the Warzone recap. But continuing with the promo, VIP are taking the belts back to Warzone where they belong. Anybody on Flashbang want to whine about not getting a fair shot? Then they can go to Warzone and challenge there. Doom better be prepared, because VIP are coming to collect, as Aussie Tehran's slogan suggests. But then we have a singles match, match number 10. Um, first of all, there wasn't really any official introductory footage of them both entering the ring at the same time. As Blackwell was coming into the ring, Sheik Khan didn't wait his turn. He rather ran after the gladiator. But then, you know, you'd think, oh, this intruder, you know, why can't he wait his turn? But then if you think about all the shit Kevin Blackwell has given him in the past year or so, remember Sheik Khan wasn't around for a while because he was recovering. I guess Sheik Khan was ready for it this time. The legend, I guess, running into the ring, being prepared, and therefore he rightly earns some revenge. A win against Kevin Blackwell with a pinfall. And now we have our trio's title defense match, which is match number 11 of the afternoon. We have VIPs The Beef, Workrate Wilson, and the Doctor of Elbonomics. Sorry, I did not write your full name. There wasn't enough room, but I hope you're happy enough that I said it. And then they were facing the current title holders on... Um, wait a minute. Yes, Doom are holding the title and flashbang. I should know this. I'm the record keeper. There's a lot of information to process sometimes. But yes, Doom's faction members in this case are Michael Macabre, Mad Jack the Pumpkin King, and the Night Reaper Zerikus. In this match, Doom end up retaining their belts as Zerikus wins with a pinfall to the beef. Sorry, VIP. Better luck next time. So, you know, instead of people coming to challenge over there, I guess somebody might need to... Somebody else might need to challenge Flashbang for the belts. I guess we'll see where that goes in the future. I'm interesting to see where Doom are going to, I guess, um, offer the belts next. So then we have our main event of the Super Show afternoon, a singles match. It is our World Heavyweight Championship title defense match. Our promised number one contender of the Troll Train, Johan Mjoln, versus the title holder of Apex, who, you know, we didn't see for a few weeks. There was this strange robot taking his place. But here we see the actual skinned lizard form of Nero Napier. Once again, the firing line truck isn't here, so we don't have any evidence footage. If you want the footage, you'll have to go to the actual Twitch channel of the show, which will be discussed later. So please believe me when I say that Suicide Gemini actually interfered in this match. And I thought he was, you know, all against Nero, but then what the heck was he doing when he compromised Johan Mjorn's chance to win the belt? Johan was actually going quite smoothly. I, I forgot exactly what Suicide did, but... That allowed Nero to pin Johan. Yeah, that, that was quite an unfair match. I wonder if Johan will get to face him again, or I guess we will find out this coming week, tomorrow, what Mr. Lawson might suggest, or any fellow member of the Brass. But Suicide Gemini, you are really concerning a lot of people. I hope you get some help. Yeah, that's about it. So that brings us to the end of Sunday afternoon's Super Show. The length of that show was approximately 3 hours, 22 minutes and 50 seconds. Moving on to our segment summary, we had 12 matches, 8 promos and no backstage events. So that makes a total of 20 events for the Super Show. If we take away the audio promos, which was this week all of them, there were no in-ring promos. So 20 take away 8 audio promos is 12 produced events. Thank you for catching up with this episode of Flashbang in a Nutshell. If you would like to find where Flashbang actually airs, you can do so on Twitch 
twitch.tv forward slash Edward Bosco. I believe we are returning to our normal show time again, which is Friday, 5 o'clock p.m. PDT. Um, I guess stand by if that changes, but for now that is our normal show time. For MNW Flashbang in a nutshell, I have been Carla Bader. Thank you for listening in and wherever you are, have a good morning, afternoon, evening or night and thank you.